Hitler to solve. But Hitler sounded nice and was easy to remember. August Kubizek, the young Hitler I knew, page 40. Since the parents of Alois apparently never lived together, even after they were married, the future father of Adolf Hitler grew up with his uncle, who, though a brother of Johann Georg Hitler, spelled his name differently, being known as Johann von Nepomuk Hitler. In view of the undying hatred which the Nazi Fuhrer would develop from youth on for the Czechs, whose nation he ultimately destroyed, the Christian name is worthy of passing mention. Johann von Nepomuk was the national saint of the Czech people. Some historians have seen in a Hitler's being given this name an indication of Czech blood in the family. Alois Schickelgruber first learned the trade of shoemaker in the village of Spital, but being restless like his father, he soon set out to make his fortune in Vienna. At 18, he joined the border police in the Austrian Customs Service near Salzburg. And on being promoted to the Customs Service itself nine years later, he married Anna Glasselhörer, the adopted daughter of a customs official. She brought him a small dowry and increased social status, as such things went in the old Austro-Hungarian petty bureaucracy. But the marriage was not a happy one. She was 14 years older than he, of failing health, and she remained childless. After 16 years, they were separated, and three years later, in 1883, she died. Before the separation, Alois, now known legally as Hitler, had taken up with a young hotel cook, Franziska Matzelsberger, bore him a son named Alois in 1882. One month after the death of his wife, he married the cook, and three months later she gave birth to a daughter, Angela. The second marriage did not last long. Within a year, Franziska was dead of tuberculosis. Six months later, Alois Hitler married for the third and last time. The new bride, Clara Pulzo, would shortly become the mother of Adolf Hitler, was 25, her husband 48, and they had long known each other. Clara came from Spital, the ancestral village of the Hitlers. Her grandfather had been Johann von Nepomuk Hitler, with whom his nephew, Alois Schickelgruber Hitler, had grown up. Thus Alois and Clara were second cousins, and they found it necessary, as we have seen, to apply for Episcopal dispensation to permit the marriage. It was a union which the customs official had first contemplated years before when he had taken Clara into his childless home as a foster daughter during his first marriage. The child had lived for years with the Schickelgrubers in Braunau, and as the first wife ailed, Alois seems to have given thought to marrying Clara as soon as his wife died. His legitimation and his coming into an inheritance from the uncle who was Clara's grandfather occurred when the young girl was 16, just old enough to legally marry. But as we have seen, the wife lingered on after the separation, and perhaps because Alois in the meantime took up with the cook, Franziska Matzelsberger, Clara, at the age of 20, left the household and went to Vienna, where she obtained employment as a household servant. She returned four years later to keep house for her cousin. Franziska, too, in the last months of her life, had moved out of her husband's home. Alois Hitler and Clara Pulzel were married on January 7, 1885. Some four months and ten days later, their first child, Gustav, was born. He died in infancy, as did the second child, Ida, born in 1886. Adolf was the third child of this third marriage. A younger brother, Edmund, born in 1894, lived only six years. The fifth and last child, Paula, born in 1896, lived to survive her famous brother. Adolf's half-brother, Alois, and his half-sister, Angela, the children of Franziska Matzeltberger, also lived to grow up. Angela, a handsome young woman, married a revenue official named Raubal, and after his death worked in Vienna as a housekeeper, and for a time, if Haydn's information is correct, as a cook in a Jewish charity kitchen. In 1928, Hitler brought her to Berchtesgaden as his housekeeper, and thereafter one heard a great deal in Nazi circles of the wondrous Viennese pastries and desserts she baked for him, and for which she had such a ravenous appetite. She left him in 1936 to marry a professor of architecture in Dresden, and Hitler, by then chancellor and dictator, was resentful of her departure and declined to send a wedding present. She was the only person in the family with whom, in his later years, 
He seems to have been close, with one exception. Angela had a daughter, Gaily Raubau, an attractive young blonde woman with whom, as we shall see, Hitler had the only truly deep love affair of his life. Adolf Hitler never liked to hear mention of his half-brother. Alois Matzelsberger, later legitimized as Alois Hitler, became a waiter. For many years, his life was full of difficulties with the law. Haydn records that at 18, the young man was sentenced to five months in jail for theft, and at 20, he served another sentence of eight months on the same charge. He eventually moved to Germany, only to become embroiled in further troubles. In 1924, while Adolf Hitler was languishing in prison for having staged a political revolt in Munich, Alois Hitler was sentenced to six months in prison by a Hamburg court for bigamy. Thereafter, Haydn recounts, he moved on to England, where he quickly established a family and then deserted it. The coming to power of the National Socialists brought better times to Alois Hitler. He opened a Bierstube, a small beer house, in a suburb of Berlin, moving it shortly before the war to the Wittenbergplatz in the capital's fashionable West End. It was much frequented by Nazi officials. During the early part of the war, when food was scarce, it inevitably had a plentiful supply. I used to drop in occasionally at that time. Alois was then nearing 60, a portly, simple, good-natured man with little physical resemblance to his famous half-brother, and in fact indistinguishable from dozens of other little pub keepers one had seen in Germany and Austria. Business was good, and whatever his past, he was now obviously enjoying the prosperous life. He had only one fear, that his half-brother, in a moment of disgust or rage, might revoke his license. Sometimes there was talk in the little beer house that the Chancellor and Fuhrer of the Reich regretted this reminder of the humble nature of the Hitler family. Alois himself, I remember, refused to be drawn into any talk whatsoever about his half-brother. A wise precaution, but frustrating to those of us who were trying to learn all we could about the background of the man, by that time had already set out to conquer Europe. Except in Mein Kampf, where the sparse biographical material is often misleading and the omissions monumental, Hitler rarely discussed, or permitted discussion of in his presence, his family background and early life. We have seen what the family background was. What was the early life? The Early Life of Adolf Hitler The year his father retired from the customs service at the age of 58, the six-year-old Adolf entered the public school in the village of Fischelham, a short distance southwest of Linz. This was in 1895. For the next four or five years, the restless old pensioner moved from one village to another in the vicinity of Linz. By the time the son was 15, he could remember seven changes of address in five different schools. For two years, he attended classes at the Benedictine Monastery at Lombach, near which his father had purchased a farm. There, he sang in the choir, took singing lessons, and, according to his own account, dreamed of one day taking holy orders. Finally, the retired customs official settled down for good in the village of Leonding, on the southern outskirts of Linz, where the family occupied a modest house and garden. At the age of 11, Adolf was sent to the high school at Linz. This represented a financial sacrifice for the father and indicated an ambition that the son should follow in his father's footsteps and become a civil servant. That, however, was the last thing the youth would dream of. Then, barely 11 years old, Hitler later recounted, I was forced into opposition to my father for the first time. I did not want to become a civil servant. The story of the bitter, unrelenting struggle of the boy, not yet in his teens, against a hardened and, as he said, domineering father, is one of the few biographical items which Hitler sets down in great detail and with apparent sincerity and truth in Mein Kampf. The conflict aroused the first manifestation of that fierce, unbending will which later would carry him so far, despite seemingly insuperable obstacles and handicaps, and which, confounding all those who stood in his way, was to put an indelible stamp on Germany and Europe. I did not want to become a civil servant. No, and again no. All attempts on my father's part to inspire me with love or pleasure in this profession by stories from his own life accomplished the exact opposite. I grew sick to my stomach at the thought of sitting in an office, deprived of my liberty, ceasing to be master of my own time, 
and being compelled to force the content of my whole life into paper form.